This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we'll discuss psychological and emotional issues common in today's world and what to do about them. I'm Dr. Margaret, and Self Work is a podcast dedicated to you taking just a few minutes today for your own self work. Welcome or welcome back to Self Work. I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. I'm a clinical psychologist. I've been in private practice for, gosh, it's 2019 almost, so that means I have been in practice for 26 years here in Fayetteville, Arkansas. I started podcasting a couple of years ago because I wanted to extend the walls of my practice, not only to those who might be in therapy already or have been in therapy and simply want to know perhaps another perspective about depression or anxiety that would be helpful to them, but also to those who are new to trying to cope with whatever mental illness or problem that they have, be it a relationship issue, problems with communication, family dynamics, anything that might be causing stress and problems. And even to those of you who might never darken the door of a therapist because of the stigma involved in it or that you believe you need to do it for yourself, who see therapy as weakness or Somehow you're too fragile if you go into therapy. None of that is true. True therapeutic work takes a lot of strength and a lot of courage. But for whatever reason you're listening, welcome to Self Work. We're going to be talking today about something that you can use. Again, you know, I stress what you can do about it. Something you can use to develop more perspective on your own life. There are many ways to do that. But a helpful tool is a timeline. Because a timeline of your own life helps you see how events in your life are connected, maybe what led to what, and it can help you think a little more objectively about yourself and see how your present perspective may have been affected by your past. It's always interesting to me that this is a new concept for many people, that something that happened to them in the past could be influencing their present Being a therapist, it seems like something I deal with every day, but actually, to some people, it's a novel idea. I'll offer a couple of examples from people I've seen to help you see how a timeline can be helpful. But that's what we're going to focus on today. Our listener email is from a mom and a wife who's gotten lost caring for her children and has grown very detached from her husband, although she says she still loves him. Now, this is a situation that for both men and women can be pretty common. So you can listen in and see how I at least tried to help her. So welcome to Self Work. Let's sit back and relax and talk about developing perspective. If you've listened to self-work for a while, you'll know that I like to really focus on tangible things that you can do to help yourself grow in the direction that you want to go. One of those things today that we're going to talk about is a timeline. Now, what am I talking about? Basically, it's a chronological ordering of powerful events or experiences you've had in your life, both wonderful things and painful things that were important markers for you. So if they were significant somehow for you, please include them. Basically, you can take a piece of paper or a poster board or even index cards, and you can do a horizontal line and then basically segment it into years. So what happened in 1994, what happened in 2005, what happened in 2015, both good and bad. Some people put the more positive things on the top side of the line. Some people put more painful things on the bottom side of the line. I've had people use index cards, and each index card is a year, so they can really look back on that year. You can do it any way you really want to. You can be creative. Some people put positive things in a bright color of ink and more negative things in a darker ink. But basically, you want to be able to look at it and see what happened in that year that was important to you. It's also really important that you not discount things that may have been somewhat small 
or seemed small at the time, but looking back, you realize they really were important. Let's talk about positive things. Maybe you met a mentor, a teacher was especially kind, you won a competition, or more sad things, painful things, you didn't get into the college you wanted, or you had a dog that you absolutely adored that died, your mom or your dad married a step-parent that was mean to you, or a great friend moved away. Any of those things might be important things in your life. Now, some of those things are going to be things that perhaps you don't even like to think about, things that you may have shoved into your emotional closet, into the back reaches of it so that you don't think about it. Those are important to include as well. So as much as you don't like to think about them or recognize them as important, please pull them out of that emotional closet now and put them on your timeline. You may remember a lot from your childhood or you may not. Just write down what you remember. Some people turn to friends or family or people who knew them at a certain time in their life and say, you know, do you remember kind of what was happening in my life at that point? I'm having a hard time with that particular year or that particular year in school, for example. Also, please, if you tend to be perfectionistic, don't turn this into some kind of activity where you have to be perfect. My own timeline would be incredibly messy. (laughs) I'll give you an example from my own life of nothing being too small. My mom sat me down when I was around 26 and said, I need to talk to you about something. Now, she would never really confronted me very seriously in my lifetime, which is hard to imagine. I know from some of you who got criticized constantly. And I've given her lots of reasons in the past. I have a talk. But this time she seemed like she had something very important to say to me. I'd recently married and gained about eight pounds up to a whopping 120 pounds, which is a weight I can barely remember these days. But what my mom said to me was, you know, your weight is getting out of control. That five-minute conversation was very shaming to me and led to other problems recurring because I'd had anorexia and I turned back to it. Now I remember it as a signpost of my mother's own eating disorder and perfectionism, but it took me years to realize that. So that five-minute conversation would be on my timeline. Now, it can take quite a while to create this, or if you're more simplistic, not all that long. If you've lived a long time, it can also take you a while. But what I want you to do as you do it is begin to ask yourself some questions. I want you to look at your timeline and think, If X hadn't happened in 2002, would Y have happened last year? How are things connected? How has my past shaped the way I think about today? How did I learn if the world was safe or unsafe, kind or unkind, rational or irrational? Remember, you don't have to stop on your timeline with childhood. Your adult years are important, too. Obviously, you can take an exercise like this to a therapist if you're in therapy, and y'all can go over it together, and she or he can look at it and say, wow, have you ever wondered if this hadn't happened or if something is missing from a childhood, that that would be important to you today, that that would be governing even some of your reactions, some of your beliefs, some of your experiences of life that those things have connections in the past. And it can really help you see what you may be discounting or simply not acknowledging or not even remembering. The things that shaped you, both positive and painful. It's a way of honoring yourself in the life that you've lived so far. Here's an example of someone that I worked with that used her timeline to see what exactly was causing her problems with her husband currently. We'll call her Chandra. Chandra grew up in a really supportive family. She'd been adopted, which was obviously on her timeline, and felt as loved and cherished as her siblings. When she was accepted to her dream college, also on her timeline, she was ecstatic. But the loss of the security she'd always counted on was more than she'd anticipated, and she felt uncomfortable. 
Everyone was smart. Everyone was a superstar academically. And she told herself just to get a grip. Her parents came to see her on Parents Weekend and told her she looked tired. And her response was, you know, I'm fine. I'm really good. But then a guy began paying attention to her. We'll call him Marcus. She fell really hard for him. And he wanted to be with her every minute she wasn't in class. So she was right there for him. He hadn't had a great family, and she felt like she'd been so loved that she could share that love with him. And unfortunately for her, that became her job, to try to help him feel better about himself. When he began bossing her around, even asking her to do some things sexually she didn't want to do, she thought it came from his past, so she would forgive him. He'd ask for forgiveness, and she'd accept his apology. But the pattern became more and more demeaning as he ramped up his demands. They were together three years, and her friends watched her changing from being open and bright and a high achiever to someone who was really closed off, still smiling, still achieving, but on automatic pilot. What did she do? She covered up her hurt and her pain. Only when she caught Marcus with someone else did she escape, but the damage had already been done. She decided then and there that no one would ever hurt her again. And she'd stay in control for the rest of her life. So the breakup was an important point on her timeline. Her decision to always be in control. Unfortunately, Chandra's answer became her problem. So when she got married, no one knew her. Not even her husband or best friends because she was so in control. She and her husband fought about their intimate relationship on a regular basis because she'd come to believe that she simply wasn't interested in sex. It was only when she had everything in her life that could bring her happiness that she realized something was terribly wrong. She was horribly lonely. Now, before she did her timeline, she'd always blamed her discomfort with being vulnerable sexually on the fatigue of rearing her children and a strenuous work schedule. Yet, After her timeline, she could see that Marcus's sexually abusive treatment of her was a turning point in her life. Her absorption of shame had caused her to withdraw, to try to remain subtly in control, to distrust men in particular, and to have difficulty with opening up in relationships. So you can clearly see how her timeline helped her emotionally connect with pain because it was important enough to put on the timeline. She shared this information with her husband, and he understood better what was going on, and they began to have a completely different conversation about intimacy than they ever had before. But my point is, when you take the time to do a timeline, then you're looking at that year with a magnifying glass saying, what happened? Did anything happen in this year that was important to me? And that very act of noticing, of giving something attention and remembering either how joyful it was or how painful it was, that can give you perspective on yourself and your own life. As I sit and listen to a new patient's history, I'm actually creating a little timeline in my own head for them because I want to begin to note what is important that has happened to them that could be influencing who they are sitting right in front of me today. And someone will often look at me and say, I never really thought that was all that important. So it can be very helpful to take the time and the energy to create your own timeline. You know, a frequent term that I hear people use all the time is that they say they have baggage. And of course, what they're talking about are the traumatic things or the painful things from their past, the confusing things, the emotions that may distort their views now. It's their baggage. It's what they carry around with them. Well, part of therapy, part of your self-work, is to begin to let go of some of that baggage. And I think a timeline can be a way to help you develop more understanding, more insight, more compassion, more acceptance of who you are so you can let go of that emotional baggage.
Our listener email today I chose because I think it is such a common problem in partnerships and marriages. So let me read you what she sent. I discovered your podcast recently, and I'm really enjoying listening to them. Of course, that's great. I love that. I'm in my late 40s and mom to three children, 16, 11, and 6. I have a history of depression, which my husband says is reactionary. When things get tough, I get overwhelmed. And I think it's a bit hormonal, too. I've had a low dose of antidepressants in the past. But since I got a dog four years ago and I started running with him, I've not needed any medication. I do have low self-esteem and confidence issues, which I hide very well as a result of my upbringing. My mom was very volatile and used to beat us. She thinks this was a normal upbringing, but it has really affected me. My husband was in the military and we moved around quite a lot. Now he works away, so he's only home on the weekends. I'm really struggling to find my purpose in life and with depression. I do a small job on the side, but it only takes about one day a week. I'm torn between wanting my kids to have a great childhood, which they are and they're all doing very well, and finding something to help me be happy. I spend my days cooking, cleaning, looking after the kids, the dog, and I spend my evenings dropping and picking them up from the various after-school clubs and activities. I've undertaken hobbies over the years, but they all get dropped because of either lack of time or lack of confidence. I feel I'm not good enough. My husband wants us to move to where he is, but the kids really don't want to move. They remember all the moving when they were young. If I'm honest, I don't want to move again either. I'm also angry because I feel like I've sacrificed a lot over the years for my husband's career, and now I might have to do it again. I still love him, but the relationship bores me. I'm a very emotional person, and he's not. He says that I blame him for everything that's wrong in my life because I feel trapped by the children and how we've ended up living apart. I'm feeling depressed, lonely, and I don't know where to begin to sort myself out. I feel I have such huge responsibilities to my family that there's no time for me. I have no friends I can talk to about this because they look at my life and think, what's she complaining about? Any advice would be greatly appreciated. So this is obviously a multifaceted kind of question because there are a lot of things in her life that aren't what she really wants. Parenting. Wow. (laughs) I call children little black holes. (laughs) They always are needing something. And it's hard, especially when you're a single parent, which basically she is. She's a single parent, like maybe many of you are. So here's my best effort at a response. I'm so glad that the podcast has been helpful to you. It sounds to me as if your running was not only helpful because it's great exercise, but a real depression reducer because it was about you. You and your dog had a life outside of the family. It does sound as if you feel trapped by your life. And you and your husband are caught in a fight I've heard many times, one where he doesn't feel appreciated enough for what he does, and neither do you. I call that fight, who's working harder in the family fight. I'm not sure from what you say how the two of you are acting as a team and prioritizing things. In fact, it doesn't sound like you are. Decisions like where you live, what schools your kids attend, and both of you being somewhat fulfilled in the process are all important things to consider, but I hear a lot of resentment on both sides. You also say you find other things to do but quit due to lack of your own ability to put yourself first and make what you want important, or you're undermined by insecurity. That's a problem only you can solve. It feels insecure to do things that you haven't done before, because change and growth always involve risk. But deciding that it's time for you to take those risks and grow your own life is important. Your history of abuse is also likely active here. You certainly didn't get the message you were important. In fact, quite the opposite. And it sounds as if you're trying very hard to parent well so that your own children don't feel the way you did. Wow, that takes a lot of integrity and courage. But you're getting lost in the process. You know, one of the things I tell people like this frequently is that they didn't learn 
that their needs were important. So they're actually treating themselves the same way their parent treated them. You can hear that she's demeaning herself and criticizing herself just like her mom did. So you have to let go of doing that and decide that you can risk looking like you're learning. You're simply learning. So I hope that she finds herself, but she's going to have to take some risks in order to do so. And as far as her relationship with her husband, hopefully they're not so detached that they can't begin to find their love again and express it through compromise and letting the other one know how grateful you are for the work that they do. Thanks so much for listening to Self Work today. I am very, very honored that there are more and more of you who are listening all over the world. In fact, this email was from a woman in England. And I love getting your emails. Please do email me at askdrmargaret at drmargaretrutherford.com and I will answer you. I'm getting more and more of them and I certainly don't want to dissuade you from sending them, but please know that it may take me a little bit longer to get back with you. My website is drmargaretrutherford.com and you can go there. I do weekly blog posts and of course a weekly podcast, which if you subscribe, you will get a newsletter, including all of that. Also, I've started a new Facebook group. You can get to know me a little bit better. I can get to know you a little bit better. It's facebook.com slash groups slash self-work. We're up to about 400 and almost 50 members. So I'm having a lot of fun with that and hopefully being helpful. Please rate or review self-work wherever you are, especially those written reviews really tell me what you enjoy, what you don't enjoy. And that gives me a lot of feedback, which is very motivating. So thanks for being here. Take very good care. I'm Dr. Margaret, and you've been listening to Self Work.